Ready to make a spoil board for your Pro Over XL 4030? Then stick around because that's what we're doing in this episode. Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of James Dean Designs. If you're new to the channel and enjoy CNC, make sure you hit that subscribe button to get all the latest videos. In today's episode we're going to be making a spoil board for the Pro Over XL 4030. There are a couple of advantages to a spoil board. The main two that we're interested in is the fact you can cut all the way through your material without having to worry and we can do something called facing the spoil board which basically means we make the spoil board perfectly parallel with the x-axis gantry and in short this basically avoids having something like a shallow cut on one side of the machine and a deep cut on the other side so it just makes our end results even better. Now some of you may be thinking well doesn't this machine already have a spoil board? No, it has an MDF bed and there is a crucial difference between the two of them. With a spoil board you, sh you can cut into it without worrying about damaging any of your bits. Now with an MDF bed like this it's got bolts in it, it's got threaded inserts in it, so although you may be able to cut in certain areas, if for example you're cutting near this front edge where there's three or four bolts that are very close to the surface, you will easily damage one of your bits and that's exactly what we're going to make a spoil board today. Now towards the end of the video we'll also talk about tramming which is basically where we want to get our Z assembly perfectly perpendicular to the bed itself and it just gives us even better results when we're doing any of our cutting. But first let's take a look at everything we're going to need to get this spoil board done. So to begin with we obviously need a piece of MDF but in fact we need two pieces. The reason for this is we want to be able to utilise all the threaded inserts that are already in the bed already and to do that we have to cut all the way through the MDF. As just mentioned we run the risk of hitting the bolts and threaded inserts by doing that. So the solution is we cut two pieces of MDF at the same time, essentially we make two spoil boards together. We cut the top one, flip it over, cut the bottom one and that way we've never actually gone into the bed. It also means that once the first spoil board is ruined we've got another one ready to replace it. Now the measurements for the MDF that you need will be 400 millimeters wide by 300 millimeters deep, essentially the cutting area of the machine itself. Now there is a reason we're not going all the way to the back with the MDF. When we come to face the spoil board later, what that essentially does is takes a thin layer off the top of the MDF. And when we do that, if we had a full piece of MDF, we would end up with a bit of a step here at the back. And what would happen is if you put a piece of material on that step, obviously it would never sit perfectly flat. So that's one of the reasons that we're not using a full piece of MDF. Now I have heard of suggestions of machining the front half, spinning it round, machining the back half. But the downside to doing that is you've got to stick it down, essentially then re-lift it back up, rotate it, do exactly the same again, and you just run the risk of more errors happening. Whereas this way, we've got the cutting area that we need, we can still put pieces of material on that are bigger, if need be, just put a bit of support under the back. So it's an ideal solution to make the spoil board for this machine. And it means we can still use the threaded insert at the back, for clamping things down. All of the tools that I'm about to go through can be found in the description area below. Do check it out, it is a very useful area where I put all the files that we're using in every tutorial as well as other useful information that you can find such as ways to support the channel. So to machine the holes in the MDF we'll be using a 3.175mm flat end mill or a 1 8 flat end mill. I think you get a set of these with the machine itself. Next, to surface the piece of MDF, we'll be using a bottom cleaning bit. Now, this one is a 22mm. The code I'll be designing for this can take 20mm up to 25mm, so it just depends which one you can get. Now, what you will notice straight away, this has a much thicker shaft. This is a quarter inch shaft as opposed to a 1 8 shaft. Now, that means we'll also need a collet insert to be able to put this into the ER11 collet. Now you can buy these as quarter inch collet inserts or 6.5 millimeter collet inserts. You can even buy them in sets of different sizes because they do sometimes work out a bit cheaper. Once the surface board has been faced, we'll be carving a little grid in it to allow for alignment. And for that, we'll be using one of the V-bits that come with the machine. It doesn't really matter whether you use a 10, 20 or 30 degree V-bit as long as it's got a sharp pointy edge to put nice crisp lines in. And finally we need a way to hold the MDF down to the bed, so as always we'll be using my favourite method of painters tape and CA glue. We'll be using Starbond because it is a brilliant product and as always there is a 10% exclusive discount code in the description area below. 
To ensure the two pieces of MDF stay aligned while we're machining them, we're quickly going to apply a bit of blue tape around the edges just to hold everything in place. To make life easier, I will quickly put some clamps on to begin with that just help keep it nice and tight while we get the blue tape on. Just make sure those corners are all aligned and then we'll get the blue tape run around the edges. So when you wrap all of your tape round, make sure there are no creases in it so that everything can sit as flat as it possibly can. Now what I forgot to mention is this is actually 6mm MDF or quarter inch MDF. That is quite crucial for the job we're about to run. So before we start machining, there are two things that we need to do. The first is to move the limit switch for the Y axis a bit further back. Now you can just see one here, which is for the front of the front stop. There's a similar one to this at the back. And when I first built my machine, I noticed it was only allowing me to cut around 290 millimeters deep. So we just need to push that back and make sure that the X axis can actually travel 300 millimeters. It's fairly easy to do. There are just two bolts that you slacken off, push it back that little bit and re-tighten them up. At this point, you'll then want to check your machine can actually travel 300 millimeters just to be safe. So I've quickly brought that to the corner. Now I'm gonna send it back 300 millimeters. Perfect. As I say, you just need to take this bracket that's stopping the limit switch at the back and just push it back a little bit further to give you the maximum travel depth. Now the next thing we need to do is try and get a rough idea of how level our bed is. So what we're going to do is a quick test where we're just going to touch the spindle down on this bottom left hand corner, reset the zero. We're then going to move it over to this corner, lower it down slowly, see what the difference is. Take it back to that corner, do the same and bring it back over to this corner. And what we will get is an idea as say if there's any difference between the way the bed is sloping. So once we reset the zero in this corner and move it over here, as we lower it down slowly, once it touches the bed, ideally it should say zero, zero, zero. But what we might find is that it's something like half a millimeter higher or half a millimeter lower. And we'll do the same in all four corners. So let's start by bringing it to this bottom left hand corner and touching the tip down right on the corner of the bed somewhere around here. So I'm just going to slowly lower it down now until it's touching the top of the bed. It's a little bit too much pressure on there, I'm just going to raise it up by about half a millimetre. And there we have it, that's just about touching the bed. So what we're going to do now is reset the Z, the Z axis zero here. Move it over to each corner and say lower it down and we'll get an indication by the figures showing in UGS of how much the bed is actually out. So now that we're over here, we're going to slowly lower it down again until it touches the top of the bed and see what the difference is. Now I can see there's still a slight gap, I'm going to reduce the feed down to about 0.1 millimetres and lower it down slowly. There we are, so now it's touching the bed. Now if I move this down in UGS, we can see the difference is minus 0.4. That means that from that point of the bed to that point of the bed, it's 0.4 millimetres lower. That's probably an acceptable tolerance. Anything more than around half a millimetre, I would suggest you may need to pack your bed up to compensate for this. We'll do the same now. Send it over to the back and test the back corner. That's just about touching the bed. We can see the difference again is 0.4 millimetres. So we'll finally send it back over to this corner and see what the difference is there. So that's now just touching the top of the bed. So what we can see is from this corner here, this is 0.4 millimetres lower, 0.4 millimetres lower, and 0.3 millimetres lower. So we have a bit of a slope going that way on the bed. Now, as I say, this 0.3, 0.4 millimetres is within tolerance. Anything more than half a mil, consider packing your bed up maybe with some spacers or bits of paper just to lift it up the front and back or whichever corner is needed. So hopefully by now you're familiar with the blue painters tape method for sticking things down. Basically what we're going to do is put a couple of strips of blue painters tape on the MDF. We're then going to put a couple of strips on the bed itself, apply some CA glue and make sure everything sticks together really well. We need to make sure everything is aligned perfectly on the bottom edge and this left hand edge here because this bottom left hand corner is the starting point for the job we're about to run.
So that's held down nice and solid now. Also make sure you fit your 3.175mm end bit into the collet. Mine's already inserted so we'll move over and get onto the PC. So now we're at the PC, let's go ahead and open up UGS and get the machine connected. I'm going to turn the power onto the machine so you may hear the fans kick in. Let's connect the machine. Excellent, as always we know it's connected correctly because we get the alarm code so we'll start by unlocking that to begin with. And as we just mentioned, we're going to move the spindle over to the bottom left hand corner of the MDF. So let's navigate it over that way now. We'll speed this up a little bit. So that's more or less there. I'm just going to move it over to the left 0.5 millimeters. You do need to be fairly accurate with this. The more accurate you can be on the starting position of the corner, the more accurate your holes are going to align with the threaded inserts. I have left a tolerance of 2mm diameter on all the holes, but as I say, the more accurate you can be, the better the outcome will be at the end. So I'm pretty happy with that. We're going to reset the zero. And then I'm just going to raise the, raise the spindle up a bit in order to set the Z probe. And we're going to move it in about 40mm as well in order to set it. Let's put the Z probe in place and run that command. Now it's quite important to make sure that your Z probe isn't actually sitting on any of the blue painters tape. Obviously while the blue painters tape is thin it will affect the measurement taken when running the probe. Excellent with the probe run let's move that back out the way and we'll return to zero just to be sure. I can see that's just come back a little bit too far, my initial uh, zero wasn't quite accurate so I'm going to take this forward very slightly. That's much better and I'll click reset zero again. What we're going to do now is load in the file on my desktop for machining the holes out. So we head over to desktop, 40 30 holes and open. And as you can see this is just going to machine a series of holes that matches the bed itself. In regards to the speed on your machine, I typically turn mine all the way up and then just turn it back a little bit so it's running at around 90%. So let's set this off and get it going. So with that finished, let's send the gantry back, get this cleaned up, flip it over and do exactly the same again. I'd also suggest at this point just running a light bit of sandpaper over all the holes just to allow it to sit flat when we flip it back over. Now obviously remember when we flip this over we need to flip it over that way so we go like that as opposed to flipping it front to back because that makes sure all the holes are lined because the bed is symmetrical. So we've just done the same again, applied the painter's tape and on here as well and a quick layer of glue. As I say, make sure you've got no rough edges of the tape around the edge because it will stop it from sticking down flat. We'll put a bit of activator on and get it stuck back down. So with that set, let's return the spindle back to zero and run the same program again. And again we'll just send the gantry back out the way and get all this mess cleared up and then we should have two spoil boards ready to mount onto the bed properly. Just take a bit of force to get it off the bed and there we are, it comes away. As we can see, holes all the way through, might need a little bit of a cleaning up but that's the spoil boards pretty much ready so we'll separate these and see how they look on the bed. So I've just separated the spore boards and quickly ran a piece of sandpaper over the top to take off any edges on the holes. As we can see it's not been fixed down yet but what is great news is obviously we can see all the threaded inserts through the holes. I've also left the bolts available along the bottom edge should we ever need to take the bed off. 
So next we're going to actually fix this down to the bed itself, again using blue tape and CA glue. What I strongly suggest you do first is make sure this is all cleaned down, that there's no dust on it. The same with the underside of the actual board itself, make sure everything is clean and dust free. What we're going to do is then layer everything with blue tape. What I would suggest doing is using a, a small cutting knife and just going around all the holes taking those out on both the board and the bed just to stop any issues when we put the clamps through later. So we'll get that done now. So we've got all the blue tape on, we've cut all the holes out. It's not the neatest of job, but you just need to make sure that none of the blue tape is sticking up. What we're going to do now is put a layer of glue over it, stick it down, and then hold it in place with the clamps. Now, I'm not gonna use activator on this process because I wanna give myself a little bit more time to make sure everything's in place and secure, and also give us time to get all the clamps in place. So let's get on with that now. You want to make sure you've got glue all over the bed, especially around the edges, just to make sure it holds everything down. So with all the glue down, we'll put the bed in place and clamp it on. So you just want to use enough clamps to make sure that all the area is held down. We're now going to leave that for a while to dry, and when we take the clamps off, that should be held perfectly in place. So we've removed the clamps, everything is stuck down well, and we can get on with facing the board. Return the spindle back to zero, but leave the 3.175 millimeter bit in to begin with and just check that it perfectly aligns with the corner down here. Once we've done that, we're gonna raise this back up a little bit and insert the bottom cleaning bit with the collet insert. So we'll get that done now. Sometimes these can be a pain to get out. You can either just try pushing them to the one side and they usually will pop out at some point. Alternatively, push it up from underneath and it may just pop out with a little bit of force. There we are. We'll drop the new one in, place that in, and we'll start to get it positioned in the spindle and just tighten the thread up. So what we're going to do now in UGS is open up the surfacing program. We'll open that in and load it up. And what we can see there, it is just running backwards and forth quite a few times. And it's going to take 0.4 millimeters off in one pass. So this will take approximately about half an hour to complete. If you have more than 0.4 millimeters to take off, you may need to do multiple runs. Now, I suspect I will also need to do a second run after doing this, but we'll see how we get on. So to begin with, we're going to jog the head in by about, I don't know, 40 millimeters diagonally, just to run the Z probe. We'll place the Z probe in place. And let's run the command. Excellent, we'll remove that out of the way. And as always, we'll return to zero just to be safe. Now what we're expecting to see is a bit of material taken off every area of the bed. If for any reason you see that one side hasn't been touched, then it just means you need to lower the spindle down by another 0.4 millimeters and run the program again. But let's get this first pass done and we'll click start now. So the camera might just be able to see this. What we've essentially got is it's machined all of this area here. It's done a little bit of this corner, but it's actually missed quite a bit. Now it may be imperfections in the MDF itself. There may have been a little bit of a bow or something in it as we clamped it down. So what we're gonna do is lower the spindle down another 0.4 millimeters, reset the zero and run it all again. Now if you're in any doubt as to whether you're taking uh, material off the top layer, a simple trick is to use a pencil just scribble all the way over it. And this is a really easy way to tell whether you've taken the top surface off because obviously once all that pencil has gone, it means we've taken a full layer off the whole spoil board. So what we're going to do is click return to zero and send it to the original origin. We're then going to lower that down by 0 0.5 four millimeters, which is the depth of the pass that we're taking off. So it'll basically take a new pass off. We'll lower that down reset the zero and I've also just sped up the process for this I think I took it a bit safe going at 500 millimeters per minute so I've taken it up to 750 millimeters per minute so I'm simply just going to load the code back in to bring in the new settings 
there we are. So we'll get that started again. So what I should have really stressed earlier is that whenever you're facing something like MDF, it's gonna generate a lot of dust. That's not good for your lungs. Make sure you're using a dust chute, an enclosure, or at least a well-ventilated area so you're not breathing it all in. So there we have it, the spore board is essentially done. You may find that if you use a slightly smaller bit than this, you may have little bits on the corners that just need to be taken off with something like a Stanley knife. Now, I'm not sure if the camera quite picks this up, but there are a lot of horizontal lines basically from where it has been machined. I talked at the start of the video about tramming and these are basically what these lines are. They're tramming lines. And that's because something on this machine isn't quite perpendicular to the bed. Now you can hardly feel these, so that is good news. It means things are fairly accurate, but we can take a look at what tramming is in more detail and see if there is any way that we can improve it. So as already mentioned, tramming is about looking how perpendicular this setup is in relation to the bed itself. Now, when you're using smaller bits in this spindle, you're not really gonna notice any difference. But when you're using something like the surfacing bit that we just had, if this is tilted in one direction or the other, whether that's front, back, left or right, it's gonna be cutting deeper on one side than it will the other. And that's why we end up with these tram lines because technically one edge is deeper than the other edge. So it looks like there's all these lines across the spoil board. Now the way we get around this is we can adjust this setup to try and counteract some of the angle that it is cutting at. And to do that we need some sort of tramming jig. Now this is one that I designed and 3D printed. I'll share the file in the description area below. And we're just using an old 1 8 bit in the end just to act as the actual last part of the tramming jig. Don't worry if you haven't got a 3D printer, you can essentially use anything that looks like that type of shape. What I've done here is simply zip tied two Allen keys together and that does exactly the same job. You can use something like a wire coat hanger and make that shape out of it. Maybe a welding rod, anything that you can basically bend into that type of shape and that will help us tram the machine. So I'm quickly just gonna insert this into the collet and just pinch that up a little bit, doesn't need to be too tight finger tight is enough. Now essentially what we're going to do is lower the z-axis down until this just about touches the surface. And we'll do that slowly now. I should say at this point I have turned the power off to the machine just for safety but you do need to be careful because obviously this has a bit of weight in it and it will naturally pull itself down the more you turn it. So as that just touches the bed a little bit more that's almost there there we are. You can just hear that scraping noise now. So that means obviously it is touching the bed there. And if we slowly rotate this round, do you hear that? It's obviously not touching in this area of the bed. So it appears the back corner is slightly lower than the front part is. So I'm just gonna raise this up by one click. Rotate that again, it's stopped touching now, that's a little bit too much. Right, there we are. So what we can hear now is that quarter of the circle that we're doing is touching the bed and the rest of this isn't. So that essentially means that the spindle is leaning diagonally back towards that corner. Now what we need to do is adjust this on two axes. So we need to release these bolts in the Z setup and this will allow us to turn it left and right or tilt it left and right, sorry. And then to do the opposite directions, the front and the back, we release the bolt in the gantry and this just gives us a little bit of play. There's not much in it, but we are talking about tiny measurements here. So we'll go around and do that setup now and just try and get this a bit better so it's touching all the way around when that rotates. When releasing these four bolts, be careful not to release them too much, otherwise the spindle will drop. We just need to release them enough so that we can have a little bit of play in the holder, but not too much that it actually moves all the way about. So you only want to try releasing them maybe a quarter or half a turn. Some are a bit tighter than others. Then that should just give us enough play now. I'm just going to try moving this slightly. I think that would be more than enough. You might not have even seen that on camera, but as I say, it's small measurements that make a big difference. I'm gonna pinch that back up. Let's try rotating that again. It's 
definitely more accurate now. It's touching three quarters of the right round, but we've still got this front quarter that's not quite touching. So I'm happy with those. I'm going to pinch that up a little bit more, make sure everything is tight. And we'll then take a look at the x-axis gantry to try and get a bit of adjustment out of that. Now there are four bolts on either side of the gantry. When you're doing these adjustments, don't release all four. Release three, but leave one in place. And that should just allow it to pivot slightly to get that little bit of movement that we actually need. Now we know this front corner is high, so basically the top needs to tilt towards us and the bottom needs to go away a little bit. So we're just gonna apply a little bit of pressure and see if we get any movement in that. I'm just going to raise that up because it is touching a bit heavy on the board. So it's touching at the front now, but not at the back. So we're just going to tilt it backwards a little bit, try and counteract that. Now it's not touching anyone. Anyway. Lower that down one click. And again. Just very slightly catching on that left hand edge now. So what I'm going to do is pinch those back up and I might come back and readjust this shortly. So it's taken a little bit of tweaking, but what you can now hear is that that is touching the bed all the way around, which is exactly what we want. And just to prove my point that you don't need a fancy type of jig, I've now inserted the Allen keys. And as we can see, it's touching all around with that as well. So with the servicing and tramming done, if your tram marks on your bed are quite significant, as in you can feel the ridges when you run your fingers over it, do just go back one step, resurface the machine and now with your spindle being trammed incorrectly it should get rid of all of those lines and just make it much smoother. My lines were not that prominent, you couldn't even feel them when running your hand over the bed. It was only in certain light angles that you could see them, that's why I didn't do it. But if yours are more prominent, definitely go back one step, resurface the board before moving on to the next step. Now the next step that we're going to do is engrave an alignment grid on top of the spoil board. Now the reason I say alignment grid is because there's no set measurements to this, it is purely for alignment purposes. If you imagine when we stuck our spoil board down, let's say hypothetically it was one degree, one degree twisted in relation to the frame of the CNC machine. Every time we align a piece of material to that spoil board, that's also going to be twisted. So things would never quite come out right. What the alignment grid does is gives us perfect vertical and horizontal lines in relation to the uh, the CNC machine itself as opposed to the spoil board, which just guarantees that we're going to have much better alignment with our materials. So let's move over and get on and get that done. So what we've done now is brought the spindle back over to the bottom left hand corner, installed the 20 degree V-bit. As I stressed earlier, it doesn't need to be 20, it can be 10, it can be 30, as long as it's sharp and pointy. Now the next thing we're going to do is reset the zero in this position. We're going to move it in 40 millimeters diagonally to do the Z probe. Let's put that in place and run that now. Excellent, we'll move that out of the way. Always be very careful with those V-bits, they are extremely sharp. Now at this point we'll return back to zero again just to check that it is all in the correct position. Excellent, let's load in the grid file. I'll click on grid, open. And as we can see, it's just a series of lines going forward to back, left and right to give us a reference grid to align from. So with everything in place, we'll click play and get this running. So you should have a nice grid engraved on top of your spoil board now, which is perfectly aligned to the machine itself, just making everything much easier going forward to get material aligned nice and easy. Now we've machined our board, in, in fact we machined two because we've got a spare one to use later. We've faced it, we've trammed the spindle in and we've engraved a grid on top. The only last thing to talk about is finishes. You may want to consider applying some sort of finish or varnish to your board 
just to make it a bit more durable and protect it going forward. Obviously, do make sure whatever finish that you select is suitable to work with things like painter's tape. You don't want your painter's tape coming off too easily because obviously you will have a project fail. Now, I just want to say a big thank you to all my Patreon supporters who keep the channel going. It means so much and if you want to get involved, check out the links below. I really hope everyone has found this tutorial useful. As always, please give it a thumbs up if you did and make sure you are subscribing to the channel for all the latest updates. If you're about to give it a thumbs down, at least let me know in the comments section why. I always love feedback to keep improving the channel. That is everything for this episode. I'll see you all on the next one.